Cohen responded, well, Mr. President, I'm resting out the men, the horses, and the mules. And the president responded, can you tell me what they have done for the last three weeks that has tired them out so much? <laughs> and then, of course, he went one step further and he said, well, look, General McClellan, since it doesn't appear you're going to use the army, you don't mind if I borrow it for a period of time. And then, of course, the end result, he fired General McClellan. He didn't reassign him to a different command. He fired him. He was gone. His career uh, in the army uh, is gone. Uh, well, one other little side story, of course, uh, we had a review of the president uh, you know, on the ground to review the troops, and, and I remember he approached me from the left, and of course I'm on my, my horse next to uh, one of the other officers of the 20th men, and the president stopped and he said, boy, that's a fine looking horse you have, and he kept on going. My fellow officer said, isn't that odd? He complimented the horse, but he never complimented you. <laughs> Well, the president then decides he needs a new commanding general, so we called in General Ambrose Burnside. <coughs> and Burnside said, Mr. President, I, I don't want to take over command of the, the, the army of the Potomac. I, I don't have the skills. And the president said, well, it really doesn't much matter whether you think you do or don't. You are now the commanding general. <laughs> He should have listened. He should have listened to him. Because he, in essence, is going to make uh, the same mistake. He tells the president he's going to take the army down and capture Richmond, end the war by Christmas of that year, and that will be his Christmas present. That's what he said to the president. That would be my Christmas present. Well, what he didn't understand, you don't win wars by capturing the enemy's capital city. You win wars by defeating the armies of the enemy. Of course, at least McClellan, we didn't have to march all the way down as we did under Burnside. Now we had to march. Now here was the plan. We were going to cross the Rappahannock River at Fredericksburg, and then behind the river, behind the town, there's a road called the Telegraph Road. And that road goes right down to Richmond, and that was the plan. Well, it sounded okay. One problem. Uh, number one, by the time we got down, Lee had already retreated back, and he was occupying the heights behind the town of Fredericksburg. Marie's Heights, the Manuel's Heights. Number two, the pontoon boats that were supposed to ride so that the troops could cross the river and march on to Richmond didn't ride uh, when they were supposed to. So Lee's troops are already occupying Marie's Heights when the pontoon boats finally uh, arrived to cross. December 12th, the first Union troops advance across those rivers into sheer hell, the face of hell, if I could put it in those words. Confederate artillery, Confederate infantry men, uh, it, was, it was basically, one might say, slaughter. The 20th Maine, it was around noontime, finally came the orders for the 20th Maine to advance across one of the bridges and uh, the fighting was so heavy that eventually orders came to lie on the ground for protection. And then the temperatures dropped below freezing. Below freezing that night. And when the morning came, a horrible sight greeted our eyes. Confederate soldiers in desperate need of shoes and clothing had come out on the field that night and stripped the bodies of many of the dead Union soldiers. I mean, stripped them naked. So you can imagine as you, what you looked and saw 
all of these naked bodies of dead Union troops. Finally, orders came to retreat back across the Rappahannock River to the other side. Maybe Burnside should have just taken a little time off, but he wanted to keep the attack going, but so this was his plan. Now we're into January. He's going to march us down the river, heading west, and we're going to cross about 20 miles down that river at some fords at Chancellorsville, and then we're going to march and sneak up in behind Lee's rear and attack him from the rear. One problem. Lee had already anticipated that. Second problem. The rains came. Oh, you think it gets muddy in Maine in the spring? No. No, people, you don't know what mud is until you've seen mud in Virginia in the rainy season. As the husses were hauling the artillery pieces, the husses literally were buried up to their necks. I'm not exaggerating. Up to their necks in the mud. The, the artillery were buried completely under the mud. And the Confederate troops on the other side of the river were holding up signs, laughing. Yeah. <laughs> laughing. Burnside mud march. Ha ha ha. <laughs> well, the president says, no, I guess Burnside isn't the man I need either. <laughs> Maybe Burnside was right after all. He calls in General Joseph Hooker. Hooker's now appointed to command you. General. Hooker, of course, had been bad at stabbing the other Union generals. That didn't set well with the president. He even mentioned that to Hooker. He said, look, you know, you, you've been pulling this game, uh, you know, criticizing them, but I'm going to forget that and appoint you the uh, commanding general. Oh, by the way, you probably don't know it, but Hooker had a train that followed him. Yeah but it only carried women. <laughs> it only carried women for some reason. And, and guess, guess what the, 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 the troops, you know, the troops, you know, somebody say, well, you know, what, what's, what's with the women? Oh, those are hookers. <laughs> yeah, was, you know, was, uh, yeah, those are good, good hookers. <laughs> yeah. Well, come April, Hooker decides to march down to the Chancellorsville, cross the river, and attack uh, Lee. Now, Lee again, anticipating that, sent Stonewall Jackson with his corps down. He said, you know, I could be wrong, but I think that's what Hooker's plan is, and you'll be there to meet him. And that was exactly the plan. So the battle of what was known as the Battle of Chancellorsville unveiled, on uh, May 2nd, 3rd uh, of uh, 1863. General Oliver Otis Howard is now commanding the 11th Corps, and he is holding the very flank of the Union Army. And it was 5 o'clock in the evening of May 2nd, and the troops had all with Howard's Corps had all stacked their muskets, and they were all around their fires cooking the meal, their meal. And, and all of these rabbits started running through their camps, and someone said, well, what's frightening the rabbits? So then deer started bounding through. Someone said, well, not only the rabbits frightened, but the deer seem to be frightened. Wonder what's going on? Well, I got to tell you. Oh, oh. The rebel yell. Jackson men unleashed on the attack and of course drove Howard's Corps back for about two miles. Oh, let me tell you a little story about General Hooker. He, he set up his headquarters at the Chancellorsville house. Yes. And uh, the Chancellorsville was a family uh, with, with, I think they had eight children if I remember right. He, he took over the house and uh, 
Confederate artillery was fired, firing uh, in his vicinity, and he, he came out from the house, and he, he walked kind of out on the front lawn, and uh, he said, I'm a little tired, and someone brought a blanket out and said, why don't you lay down? General Hooker, he laid down on the blanket. A few minutes later, he said, I'm feeling better. He got up, took about three steps, and a Confederate cannonball landed right in the middle of that blanket. Hooker lost it. He lost all of his reasoning. It, it so shocked him. Basically, the rest of the battle unfolded without a commanding general commanding the forces. But it was costly for Robert E. Lee. Stonewall Jackson, as he had Howard's 11th Corps retreating and darkness was coming, he wanted to keep the attack going into the night. And he got right to the corner of the Bullock Road and the turnpike that goes into Fredericksburg. And there were some low hanging branches and he was parting them and just at that moment, some Confederates with the North Carolina Regiment thought he was a Union officer with some other Union officers, and the commanding officer ordered them to fire. One ball struck Jackson right there. The other one struck him right there. And down he went, and stretcher bearers carried him uh, back behind the line, but as they're carrying him, they dropped him several times. They dropped him several times. And he had to have his arm amputated. And they carried him down to Guinea Station, about 20 miles away, uh, at, a, at a house there, uh, and that's where he died, nine days later. So that was a tremendous, tremendous loss for, for Stonewall Jackson. Oh, his wife had come to visit him uh, around the 2nd of April. And she brought their young daughter that he had never seen. That he had never seen. All of these sad stories. Well, with his victory at Chancellorsville, Lee says, ah, the way is open to invade the North again. This time he was going to march into Pennsylvania. Uh, basically, Lee was still thinking if he could gain a victory on northern soil, England might still recognize the Confederacy, but as I had mentioned, that door had been closed. Uh, but his part of his plan was he was gonna he was gonna march on to the capital of Pennsylvania, slide down, capture Baltimore, and then he was from Baltimore, he was gonna capture Washington, DC. It would appear he didn't understand that the art of war is killing, uh, destroying the enemy's armies, not capturing uh, capital, so to speak. He crossed into uh, Pennsylvania. Now, the eyes and ears of his army was supposed to be the chief of his cavalry, Jack Stewart. But Stewart didn't fulfill his job. So he never really did get Lee apprised of enemy strength. On July 1st, Confederates, I can't remember who's, who, who, under whose command, requested that they be able to march into the town of Gettysburg where they thought they could get some shoes. <laughs> At least that's the story. Now, Basically, they didn't know that the Union Army wasn't too many miles away. In fact, Lee at that point thought the Army hadn't even crossed, the Union Army hadn't even crossed the Potomac River. That, that's how, how little he understood. Well, fortunately, General John Buford was commanding the cavalry unit, and, and they were down on the uh, on the Moomisburg Road, and of course, those troops came marching, and they had repeating rifles. And I think that was the difference, because they were able to delay long enough for reinforcements to come in. But then, 
Lee unleashed his troops as well 